Hello, my dears, and welcome to the very first in a new series that I'm hoping will replace the soon-to-be-ending Ages of Chaos. Yes, we're nearly at the end of that one, which is a great shame, but there's still loads to look forward to in the future, as the, uh, the Vigilist campaign stuff demonstrates. Oh my god, how stunning is all of that? Anywho, to give a bit of background on that, I thought what I'd do is go through the Horus Heresy series that is itself soon to end. The last books are being released as we speak. The very end. The Siege of Terror is imminent. Um, I thought I'd go way back. Way, way back to when the very first book was published. Um, in fact, the first two books, because there were two books published in one go. Horus Rising and False Gods. One by Dan Abnett and the other, I believe, by Mr. Graham McNeil. Two of the... Well, Dan Abnett is a legend. Dan Abnett has chops, man. He, um... He has cut his teeth on various different things. He's he writes for he's written for the Black Library quite a lot. He's written extensively for comic books and for Doctor Who and for lots of other stuff. He the man has um, tenure, so to speak. So for him, this material is obvious. Graham McNeil is also one of the strongest stable of writers from the Horus Heresy series, from the Black Library publishing house, in fact. Um, but what I find fascinating more than anything about these two books is how epoch making they were how they changed everything it's very difficult to describe nowadays because they've they're so established the background that's that's in the horus heresy books is so established as part and parcel of the general warhammer 40,000 background the books have bled into the mainstream game it's to the point whereby characters have taken traits and names and whatnot from that series. We've even got characters that derive exclusively from that series as playable characters in the game now. Um, for example, uh, before the Horus Heresy series, uh, Ahriman was just Ahriman. He didn't have a first name. He wasn't Arzek Ahriman until A Thousand Sons. Um... Abaddon, Abaddon the Despoiler, who will be a big, big part of this series, and uh, whose star is currently in the Ascendance, of course. Um, he didn't. He was just Abaddon. He didn't have another name. That was his name. He was it. But uh, the this book, uh, Horus Rising, establishes him as Ezekiel Abaddon, which is very, very cool. I have to say, more than that way more than that the thing that really surprised me about this book i i i started reading this the the black library stuff sort of around the storm of iron stage when the black library was very nascent it wasn't really as big as it later became in fact it became that way it became the the sort of publishing house juggernaut that it is now because of the horus heresy series largely um horus rising and false gods dropped like a like a some sort of accelerated torpedo that destroys worlds that the Inquisition uses into the Warhammer 40,000 background because it changed everything, absolutely everything. The things that are now canon that were not at the time, but which have just leached over from that book. For example, the notion that the original Imperium was this grand secularizing regime, that wasn't part of the background at all all up until that point up insofar as we knew the emperor's regime was always designed to be a theocracy there was nothing nothing whatsoever that stated that the emperor was trying to diminish superstition and 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 metaphysics and um sort of hairy fairy philosophy uh, and establish a secular rational regime that is something that was established in this book and i can tell you it came as something of a bloody shock because of course that sets up this wonderful layer of irony in the present day warhammer 40000 universe of which uh, robert gilliman in his present day incarnation is the ultimate expression because the imperium has become what seems to be the exact opposite of what the emperor first set out to create certainly during the great crusade the tone of the great crusade at this point because these books are set before the heresy so the 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 space marine legions and the the imperial armies are all utopian in nature it's all with great gusto they are going out there and they are conquering worlds and star systems they're bringing back new resources making new discoveries they are bringing back into the fold the lost civilizations and tribes of humanity there is this great sense of 
things being achieved, of of a new state of play, of humanity in its ascendance, a sort of golden age, if you like. And that is reflected in the characters. The characters are really interesting in this book. The space marines are so different from how they are now because they're more human. The standards that allow, that are the strictures that are placed upon uh, human beings who become space marines in the present day are so they're so profound that most human beings don't survive it. Even even when they're selected, they're the strongest of their tribes and peoples. They're the most intelligent. They're the most cunning. They're the, the most athletic. But even many of them don't survive. Back then, that was sort of true, but not to the same degree. The psychological elements, for example, the psychological scans didn't exist back then. That's why you get characters like, for example... Erebus and Corpheron being made into space marines. Not quite Corpheron, but sort of. Um, that's why you get characters, probably like Abaddon, being made into a space marine. Were Abaddon to occur as a human being in the present day, the 41st millennium, he would never have been selected. They would have, they would have sensed the ambition, the anger, the the potential in him to become tyrannical and they'd have said no they'd have they'd have rejected him but at this point that didn't happen so the space marines themselves are very different they still have this sort of removal from humanity but they are much more human in and of themselves and they interact in a much more human way this is wonderful because it separates what will become the traitor legions the chaos space marines from their present day incarnations present day space marines are basically robots they're big just sort of flesh jolums you know they are conditioned to such a degree on a genetic and psychological level that they are nothing but genetically enhanced killing machines. They they very rarely question their own conditioning or their own purpose. And when they do, they they tend to go renegade, you know? Um, but these space marines are very different. They're funny. They've got sense they've got a sense of humor. They joke with one another. They play games with one another. They have human friends. Um, one of the, the things that I really love, I really bloody love in this book, is the way it establishes how human beings operate on the Great Crusade. So you have on the on the fleets, on the great ships that the uh, Space Marine Legions inhabit. Um, you have these human populations that are not just crew, they're not just menials, they are whole entire decks dedicated to human, like little human colonies and civilizations that go through the stars with them and document and record. They're called the Remembrancers. And they're like artists, photographers, they are storytellers, they are philosophers. Their entire purpose is to act as kind of like propaganda for the Great Crusade. Um, and that's really interesting because that not only allows you to get a human perspective on things and that's very fascinating but you also through them tend to see the doubt although there is this great sense of the great crusade being the best thing that humanity has ever done the greatest endeavor that humanity has ever embarked on when the remembrances start to see the reality of it when they see the massacres that that occur, the genocide, the destruction of beauty that is necessarily part and parcel of this utopian regime. That's when the doubt creeps in. And that is reflected not only in them, but also in the space marines themselves, because they are more human. You have characters like Loken, Garviel Loken. Now, Garviel Loken is uh, the protagonist, technically the protagonist of this book. He is one of the sons of one of the, uh, the lunar wolves, as they are at the beginning. Uh, one of the lunar wolves who's very, very close to to uh, Horus himself, and also becomes part of what is known as the Mornival. Uh, Abaddon is part of that too. And the Mornival are kind of like uh, the closest brotherhood amongst the, the Lunar Wolves. They are a brotherhood that advise um, Ab uh, Horus um, on what his next course of action should be, how he should interact with his brother legions, um, how he should interact politically. It's really interesting, really fascinating. And Garviel Loken is kind of the voice of equanimity in that group. Uh, Horus has specifically selected each one of them to represent a particular aspect, like Abaddon, for example, is choler or anger, um, whereas Loken is equanimity. He's kind of the voice 
of reason in the group. It's really fascinating. And the way he interacts with his brothers and with Horus is the best part of this book. As it is in all the Horus Heresy books. Yeah, there's loads of good, you know, there's good action set pieces. There are grand wars and genocides and all sorts of stuff that happens. There's, you know, the, the Bolter Pawn stuff. There's loads of that. But the best parts of this book are the character interactions. It's where you get characters like Garviel Loken, like Abaddon, like, um... Torgadon, like little Horus Aximand, and like Horus himself, where you get an insight into what they are like. And Horus is one of the most surprising of all of them. Horus is one of the most surprising, because when you first meet him, he's telling a joke. He's having a bit of a laugh. Horus is really human. As are a lot of the Primarchs, Horus is really human in this book. Um, he has, in terms of his sincere doubts about his own position and capability, um, his ability to manage his brothers, because the Emperor has sort of given him the task of shepherding the other Primarchs, and you can imagine what that must be like, you know, that's like herding cats, you know? Can you imagine trying to get Fulgrim and Angron to cooperate, for example, or Dawn and Lorgar? It just wasn't, isn't going to happen, is it? Very, very tricky indeed. Or for that matter, Magnus and Lehman Russ. I mean, even at this point, those two are butting heads. But yeah, it's fascinating. It's fascinating to get this insight into what Horus was like before he fell. And what becomes apparent is that the beginning of Horus's fall, and yes, he is manipulated to a degree, and we'll get into that, but it's it's what allows him to fall is this deep-seated self-doubt. It's not ego. It's not ego at all. It's this deep, deep-seated self-doubt where he isn't aware of what he's capable of. And the Emperor doesn't... The Emperor is either... The Emperor is really interesting in these books because he's very distant. You hardly ever see him. And he's very mysterious. You never know really what he's up to, what his agendas are. Reading these books, you can only take one interpretation away. He's either an idiot, i.e. he doesn't understand how his actions um, are directly responsible for precipitating the heresy, or he's a bastard. He's an absolute bastard. Um, and he deliberately manipulates his sons to fall. There's some wider game at play here that we, we still don't know the answers to. Uh, for my money, I don't know. I don't know whether that will ever be answered. But it's got to be one or the other. It's one or the other. He's either incompetent or he's a complete bastard, you know? It's one or the other. Um, it's fascinating to see. Horus is not some megalomaniac. He's not some ego-driven narcissist. He's actually very, very softly spoken. He's full of self-doubt. He doesn't always know whether what he's doing is right. And that's fascinating. I love that in this book. I absolutely love it. Um, what you also get established in this book, and this is a huge change as well. This is a huge change. The word bearers are the ones that inspire the heresy. They have fallen to chaos a long, long time ago uh, with the destruction of Monarchia like decades ago after the, the Emperor's reprimand of, uh, of the Legion. And they've been working secretly since then to undermine the other legions by setting up these uh, brotherhoods, these um, fraternities amongst the other legions that are slowly and insidiously preying on their weaknesses, on their ambitions, on their human flaws and frailties, and turning them ever so insidiously, slowly, 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 against the Emperor, against the Great Crusade. Really fascinating. You have here Erebus, the Dark Apostle Erebus, who is seconded to Horus's fleet as a kind of ambassador from the Word Bearers, and it's him that slowly, 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 slowly drip feeds the poison into Horus's ear and into his soul. He's the one that leads the Legion to the world of Davin, where, of course, Horus finally falls. Um... It's fascinating. It's fascinating. There are huge changes here. Another huge change. Um, Horus isn't possessed. In the original fluff, in the original background, Horus is possessed by a demon. That's not the case here. That isn't the case here. Uh, that background has been sort of shunted over to Fulgrim. Horus 
falls of his own volition. Despite all of the manipulations of Erebus and the word bearers, ultimately it's down to him. He makes the decision. He makes the choice. And the reason, his reasoning is that he feels abandoned. It's because he feels that the Emperor has abandoned him, his sons, the other legions, and that eventually he will do away with them. That's what he feels. Eventually, once the wars are done, once everything is over, he feels that he will abandon them. And there's not, you know, that there's some truth in that. There is some truth in that. I mean, what would the legions do once the universe is conquered, when there is this grand empire of humanity, when civilization is settled and unified? Barring acting as peacekeepers and enforcers, what would the legions actually do? Many of them would need to be expunged. Of course they would. What about the world eaters? Can you imagine them operating in a time of peace? Because I can't. What about... Um, who else would need reigning in? The space wolves, probably. The space wolves wouldn't be able to operate in times of peace. No way would they. But it's fascinating to me. And it's very difficult to express to people who have come into the hobby later when this stuff was established, how much this book changed. It was probably one of the biggest changes to the background of 40k there has ever been. It deliberately, this book, upends all of your expectations. It's designed so that fans who feel as, oh, I know the background inside out are like, oh... Oh, well, that's different from what we were told. Because the background you're given in the army books and the codices and the campaign books is a kind of glossed over generalization. And also often from an imperial perspective, what you get here, and these are the best books in the series, the ones that involve the traitor legions, the ones that fall, because you get to see why. And you get to see the stuff that you never would have expected. The stuff that lends credence to what they do and why they feel the way they feel and that's brilliant that's absolutely brilliant that struck me massively about this book i have to say i loved the characters the characters are all really interesting especially uh garviel loken um it upends the mythology very succinctly but not in such a way that it would upset fans of how it originally was it just introduces these complexities and enriches the warhammer 40,000 universe it's a really good start it's not a full story because it ends quite abruptly because really that the story of um horus rising is carried over into false gods you need to read both of those together really to get the full uh feeling of it in false gods what you get is the final fall. What you get in False Gods is the uh, the events on Davin, which have you know become. They've always been referenced in the background to the Black Legion and to Horus himself, but never really established as to what happened. And what we find out is that it's not even Davin; it's a moon of Davin that Horus descends upon, where there's an Imperial freighter that's cr that's crashed, and the captain of that freighter is possessed by something. It's really weird. He's actually possessed by something from the warp, and he's carrying a blade that was given to him by Erebus. And the blade carries a very... It's an, it's an, it's an anatheme. It carries a very particular curse with it that's enough to drop a Primarch, which, of course, it has to be. Um, and that's what happens. Instead of Horus getting possessed, he gets wounded. He gets placed in this kind of fever state by a wound from that blade. And in that fever state, he starts to experience visions. He starts to commune with the gods. Erebus facilitates this. And that's when he opens his eye upon chaos in all of its majesty, upon the warp, upon the secrets that the Emperor has kept from him. Because again, this is another interesting thing. This is something that was never established in the original background. In the original background, the Imperium, Mankind, and the Space Marine Legions are well aware of chaos. They're well aware of it. In fact, the, the Space Marine Legions are designed to fight against it. That's why they were created in the original background. That's not the case here. Here, the Emperor has kept the fact of chaos and the nature of the warp away from most of his sons. Only a few know about it. Uh, Magnus does, because, of course, you can't keep it away from Magnus because it's his natural environment. I believe uh, Lorgar does to a degree, and I believe Lehman Russ does as well. But the others don't. They don't. It's kept from them. And that's fascinating, isn't it? Isn't that fascinating that there are secrets that they are kept from, that they are not told about? 
and they have to learn about it through direct experience. There are creatures in the warp. There are gods in the warp. Um, there are predators in the warp. And Horus, ultimately... To say he falls to them is kind of wrong. He doesn't necessarily fall to them. He makes a pact with them. Um, and what he on what he thinks is his own terms, which of course it's not. Um, that's when the arrogance and the ego start to creep in. That's when they start to prey upon his fundamental flaws. It's a very good book. It's very well... In fact, both of them are... Um, they follow through from one another, from one another very well, and I love the way they slowly build. So you don't get full on like warp spawned chaos stuff from the very beginning. It's actually very clean at the beginning. It's much more of a kind of um, utopian science fiction universe or questioning of the the notion of utopianism. But then you start to get these creeping elements of like surreal metaphysical horror creeping in and insanity and wonderful gribbliness and that's when you start to see the truth underneath this universe and it's really good it's very well handled there are sections in these two books both of them that scan like horror stories and are written in the styles of horror stories and they work very very well i've got to say um as beginnings go these two are very good indeed. They establish so much, so, so much, and they set up so much mystery. They make this series potentially very exciting. Very exciting indeed. And they do that wonderful thing that I always look for in Black Library fiction. I mean, for me, Black Library fiction is generally, they're, they're what I call like um, chocolate bar books. So, they, you know, you can read them in between reading other bigger, weightier tomes, you know, because they're, they're pulpy, you know, they're fun, they're, they're related to this miniature war game universe where it's all pew pew, bang bang, ah, you know, it's adults playing around with toys. Um, and in that regard, they're fun, they're just fun. But there are examples that elevate the universe and the material, and these two do exactly that. They do exactly that. And uh, well worth reading, well worth reading, especially if you are a fan of of these universes. Uh, when next we come back, we will have a look at the next in line, which I believe is Galaxy in Flames. Or is it the Flight of the Eisenstein? I believe it... it mm, I can't quite remember. Either way, book three next. Bye-bye! <laughs> Ha 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 